All right, so what are we going to talk about today? Let's do a little bit of architecture stuff. We've been doing a lot of programming. Um, Fizzbuzz, the, the main uh, problem with uh, Fizzbuzz. Uh, yeah, let's see. Okay. Is um, if you uh, returned that way, uh, it's not going to work. And the reason why it's not going to work is because uh, you, you are supposed to comment out uh, this line, uh, switch the comments on these two lines. And the reason why pop PC works and BXLR does not work is because BXLR means uh, basically go to whatever line of code is stored in the link register. Remember, all registers are just integers. And the link register holds the, uh, whenever you do a uh, branch with link like this, what the branch with link means is that it automatically saves into the link register the next line of code. It actually writes that line of code into the link register so that when somebody returns using BXLR, it jumps to that line of code and continues running. And so that's how you do a subroutine. A subroutine is you're running your code and then you jump to a subroutine. Subroutine runs for a while, then it jumps back to where it was before. And uh, the trouble, the reason why this does not work is because when you do branch with link, it sets the link register. And so it, <laughs> the link register gets overridden by, by you, you know? And so um, it, it doesn't work. And so the, uh, uh, the, the correct thing to do is to pop the, the value stored on the stack, right? At the very top of the file, we say push link register that saves the original link register. And so when you pop it, it restores uh, the original link register. And normally you would think it would be pop LR because you know you push at the very top, you push R4 through R12, and then you push LR. Actually, did uh, Yeah, that, that's also a problem. Uh, you, don't wanna, you don't want your pushes and pops to be uh, uh, a, a, <laughs> asymmetrical. Everything you push needs to be popped or you have um, you have corrupted the stack, basically. The, the, when you do a function call, the stack pointer moves down. And when you return, the stack pointer is supposed to move back where it was before. But if you push more stuff than you pop, then the stack pointer is going to keep going down every time you do a function call. So it's really important that your pushes and your pops are symmetrical. The um, the, the reason why this code isn't returning right is because uh, you push the link register, and then when you pop, uh, you pop it back into the program counter. The program counter is the next line of code that's to run. And it's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's essentially what it means, is that the program counter is a register that holds the next line of code you're trying to run. And so when you pop the link register into the program counter, it jumps back to wherever it was before. And that's the standard way of returning from a function. This works if you don't make any uh, subroutine calls, right? As long as you haven't modified the link register, that works just fine. Uh, but if, you're, if your function's more complicated, then you need to do this line instead. And so you need to delete, you need to delete that comment there and put a comment. Well, technically that line won't be called if you uncomment the first one, but yeah, to switch those two comments and it would work. And it's 45. Um, so bad arg count. It's funny. Uh, <laughs> Wheeler jumps. Um, I just like to talk to the walker bot now and then. That's funny. Um, yeah, all right. So, yeah, branches have a limitation on how far they can jump. And so they'll sometimes use trampolines and things like that where they'll actually put, like, because you can only jump, I think it's 32, 32K. Just off the top of my head, it's something like that. And so if you need to jump further than that, then what they'll do is they'll 32K away, they'll put another jump instruction and things like that. So um, there's things called trampolines and things like that. And um, Okay. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, is there any, is there anything more you need to know for the um, homework assignment? I don't think so. You can use and and or and not. The bitwise operations, you can use those if you want. Um, I don't know if you need them. Shifting, we've talked about a little bit. 
Um, why don't we Why don't we talk a little bit about shifting? I'll, let me fire up a Let me fire up one note. Um, let's rate one note. No. <laughs> is this a mobile app now? <laughs> I mean, it, I guess it technically is. But <laughs> what the hell, dude? Great. This is a computer, not a smartphone app. What the hell's going on here? All right. New page. And this is 1, 1, 28, 21. Uh, for those of you in the far future, it is 2021, not uh, not 2121. Okay. So just just as a side note, for those of you watching this performance in the future. All right. That's kind of cool. All right. So let's say we got some bits. One zero one zero one one. Okay. So this in binary is that's the ones digit. That's the twos digit. That's the fours digit the 8th digit, 16th digit, and the 32th digit. Okay. Um, so what number is this? What do you guys think? So we got a 1, we got a 2, we got an 8, we got a 32. So it's 32 plus 8 is 40. 40 plus 2 is 42 plus 1. Is 43. Are you guys comfortable making that uh, translation from binary to decimal? Just each digit, you know, it's like, you know, when you have decimal, if you have like 768, that's the ones digit, the tens digit, the hundreds digit. So this is the same thing as 700 plus 60 plus 8, right? And so this in binary is 32 plus 8 plus. Two plus one. That's reasonable. Okay, you guys got that. Undo all that then. Uh, yeah, the uh, the stock market going crazy uh, has been interesting the last few days. Um, there's been a masterful job of trolling by the Reddit people against hedge funds. Um, Base two versus base ten, yeah. So okay, so what should we talk about? Um, so let's talk about bitwise and first of all. So if we and this with uh, I don't know one one zero zero one zero, what number is that? That's uh, forty eight plus two, it's fifty. Um, if we do a bitwise and, what that means is you go through every corresponding digit in the number in binary and you and those bits together. One is true, zero is false. So one anded with zero is zero, one anded with one is one, zero anded with zero is zero, one anded with zero is zero, zero anded with one is zero, one anded with one is one. And is only true when both are true, right? And so this works out to be 34. And if you try to memorize, like if you try to think of these numbers in like decimal, it, you're, you're gonna be, it's gonna be baffling. 8 ended with 2 is 0. You know, it's like, what? You know? So if, if you were to think of these things as like a logical and, um, you will be surprised some of the time. And being surprised some of the time is a lot worse than being surprised all the time. So if it was a logical and, a logical and means anything that is not 0 is true. If it's a logical and, what happened here? Uh, if it's a logical and, the answer would be true, right? But with a bitwise and, it's false. And so don't confuse, don't confuse logical and and bitwise and. They are different operators. Now with or, have at it, right? With or, you can't be, um, you're not going to be uh, hosed, right? The same way. So bitwise or, and that's a vertical slash, not a one. Sorry, that's an or. If you if you do bitwise or, um, it's a little bit safer for use in like if statements and things like that, and the reason for that is because um, well let's 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 go through an example first. Ah, why do I keep hitting that? Um, okay, so let's do it. Let's do a bitwise or. So you go through each pair of bits, and if either of them is true, the the answer is true. So true or with true is true, 
false ordered with true is true, true ordered with false is true, false ordered with false is false, true ordered with true is true, true ordered with false is false. And so, again, if you think about these things in terms of <coughs> base 10 decibel, uh, you're going to be uh, baffled, right? So this is 48. 48 plus 8 is 56. 56 plus 3 is 59. Yeah, so 43 bitwise order 50 is 59. Like, you're just going to be like, I don't see any pattern here, right? But the good news is, if you if you confused bitwise or, again, that's or, that's not a 1. Um, if you confuse bitwise or, and logical or it doesn't hose you the same way that confusing bitwise and and logical and do. Because if you bitwise or 8 and 2, you get 10. Which is also true. <laughs> right? And so true or with true is true. Uh, whether or not you use uh, bitwise or logical. Like if we did a logical or instead, uh, the answer here would just be true. Right? And so bitwise or isn't going to give you the wrong answer if you mix it up with the logical or. And so you can use that in your code if you'd like to save yourself uh, maybe a, a cycle or two. So um, just word to the wise. Bit or, which uh, and bitwise or in assembly is or, you know, um, that, that, that is available for you. And I, I would be much more cautious with and, though. Only do and if you know and is the bitwise and, right? Um, only do bitwise and between two registers if you know the numbers are either 0 or 1, basically, is how I do that. But or, or would work with decimal numbers or bits or whatever. It, it's, it's a lot safer. So can either be the same number or higher? Yeah, for and, the answer... The uh, result uh, is always less than or equal to the original numbers. And with or, it's always greater than or equal to the original numbers. Okay. Uh, for bitwise, right? So, right? 8 bitwise or with 2 is 10, right? So, but 8 bitwise or with 8 is 8, right? So, the result of an or is always greater than or equal to or... The result of an or is always greater than or equal to the original numbers. <clears throat> and with and, the result is always less than or equal to the original numbers. Okay. So. Um, you guys cool with that? Is that doable? Reasonable? Um, XOR. We can do XOR. XOR. Uh, I mentioned last time, but let's just do an example of it. Um. XOR, there's different ways you can think of XOR. The way I like to think of it is anytime you have a 1, it flips the bit of the other guy, and it doesn't actually matter which one you do first. It's uh, symmetric. Um, so if you have a 1, you flip the, the bit above it, and if you have a 0, you leave it alone. That's Or you can think of it as exclusive OR. If either of them is true, the result is true. If both of them are true or both of them are false, the result is false. And so uh, exclusive OR or Eeyore, um, or caret, is also the same thing as not equals to, right? So exclusive or is also the not equals operator. So, uh, you might be able to use that, I don't know, who knows. So the answer here would be true, XORed with true is false, false XORed with true is true, true XORed with false is true, false XORed with false is false, false, uh, true XORed with true is false, True XORed with false is true, right? So if so, if you think of it the first way, uh, the one flips the bit above it, so the one becomes a zero. The one flips the bit above it, the zero becomes a one. The zero leaves it alone, so the one stays the one. The zero leaves it alone, the zero stays a zero. The one flips the bit above it, the one becomes a zero. The zero leaves it alone, the one stays a one. So that's that's kind of my mental model for XOR is that it a one means bit flip and zero means leave it alone. And so if you were to like XOR something with zero, it does nothing. And if you were to XOR something with uh, all ones, uh, then it flips all the bits. So uh, if you ever want to flip all the bits and you don't want to use move not for some reason, MVN is the not operator. I might have said MOVN, 
um, sorry, MDN is the not operator. It, it twiddles all the bits, all the trees. Are it's the same thing as XORing with just a bunch of ones. The same thing. Uh, a circle with a cross, yeah, yeah, that's another it's a constant challenge when teaching logic because there's multiple competing systems of terminology and symbolism. You know, not not could be written like a little finger gun. Not could be written like an exclamation mark. It's just like, eh, you know, just pick it, pick a system, <laughs> right? And so forty three x ordered with fifty is going to be sixteen plus eight is twenty four, twenty five. And so if, again, if you if you try looking at bitwise operations in decimal, um, unless you've got just this intuitive ability to convert between binary and decimal, it's almost always better to just look at it in decimal. In, in binary, because in binary, it makes sense. In decimal, it's just like, you know, and a lot of CSI 40 students write this, like 43 to the 50th power. <laughs> and they're like, the answer is 25. What just happened? Did I overflow? It's like, no, 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 you didn't do expon You didn't do exponentiation, buddy. <laughs> you, did, you did XOR by accident. And, and to me, that's a really uh, unfortunate choice of symbol because uh, everybody uses caret to mean exponentiation. And in C, it means XOR when they could have used, I don't know. I don't know, most of the symbols are taken up, huh? I don't know. You could have just written XOR. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, Windows Calculator is nice. Uh, Windows Calculator has a programmer mode that does all the bit, bit operations for you. Um, you can use them on the homework assignments that I'm going to give you guys on this. There's a worksheet on, on this kind of stuff. Okay, so let's talk about shifts. Let's talk about shifts a little bit. But before we talk about shifts, let's talk about how signed arithmetic works. Okay, so there's different ways of doing signed arithmetic. And, and a way that a lot of students think that signed arithmetic works is by using something called a sign bit. And so a lot of them think, let's let's say we're talking about uh, eight bit numbers, right? And so with an eight bit number, uh, if you have unsigned, it ranges from zero to 255. So if you have eight bits in a number, which is called a char for um, unfortunate reasons. What? So an, a char is just a signed 8-bit number in C and C++, usually. Doesn't have to be 8 bits, which is, again, unfortunate. Because it sounds like this is a letter, right? It sounds like a character, right? A char holds a letter. And sometimes it means that. Like, if you see out a char, it will print it as a letter. Even if you were trying to print it as an 8-bit integer, if you see out a char, it will come out in letter form. It'll it it it'll use the ASCII, uh, the uh, Amer you know that's a capitalized. So I'll leave it. The American something something standards interchange whatever, and so you know it has a it has a certain coding scheme that um, that says what each man ASCII. If you type man ASCII, you can look at the ASCII table, and so uh, a for example, is uh, 65. Um, the at character is 38. Okay. And so basically, if you try just outputting the number 38, like let's say, let's just say you're using a char as a number, right? Because that's all there. All all a char is is a number. And 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 this applies even if you if you explicitly say it's a number. Like if I if I create an unsigned integer 8 underscore t, which is the um, C++ way of making an unsigned 8-bit integer, if you try C outing this, it will C out using ASCII encoding, and it's stupid, because it's like, no, it's a, I, I, no, I'm just, I just want to hold a number from 0 to 255, I just want to, this is a, this is an unsigned 8-bit integer, it holds numbers from 0 to 255, every time you C out it, it's like, oh, that's the letter Q, like, n no, no, I wanted to actually print the value, dude. And so you have to cast it to an integer. If you so you have to, you have to you know do something like this. You put int in front of it before you see it out, because otherwise you're like my my numbers aren't printing. <laughs> and it's, yeah, it's just it's a very unfortunate uh, circumstance. 
because you know before they added these types um, if you just wanted to hold the number from 0 to 255 you would create an unsigned an unsigned char and an unsigned char on most systems is an unsigned 8-bit integer but not all chars chars can be as big as 255 bits yeah and so that's why it, uh, that's why I have come to vastly prefer this over this I don't like I don't like using this anymore if I want to make an 8-bit integer I say make me an unsigned 8-bit integer because then if I port my code to a system that doesn't use 8-bit chars or 8-bit bytes technically uh, it'll still work it'll still work the way it's supposed to work now are there any mainstream systems that don't use 8-bit bytes? No. no. Are, are you guys all familiar with that terminology? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. This is, an, this is called a byte. Are you guys familiar with that? Byte. And each individual uh, ones or zeros are called bits. You guys cool with that. Um, do you guys know what a half byte is? Do you guys know what a half byte, half a byte is? Four bits? Yeah, it, like Mr. Devella says, it's called a nibble. So a nibble, that's actual terminology. It, it's a nibble. Half byte is a nibble. So, yeah, really, it really is. Yeah, and don't get me started on the difference between Gibby bytes and a gigabyte. Gibby byte is the dumbest term ever. I mean, it's. I'm glad they use it, but Gibby Byte, really, really Gibby Byte, sounds like a toddler learning to speak who's doing computer science. And now we've got uh, people in Berkeley pushing for the for the Hecabyte, right? Because in or the hell not he, not Heca, sorry, the Hellabyte, the Hellabyte, because uh, NorCal people love using the word Hella, right? So. They're trying to get the next uh, standard SI prefix to be Hella, which is like 10 to the, I don't know, whatever, big number. So you can have a hard drive that is a Hella byte in size. How many bytes? It's big, let's see, it goes mega, giga, what is the million, billion, trillion, quadrillion, petabyte, so it's going to be terabyte, okay, mega, giga, tera, Peta, Hella, maybe? Or maybe there's like one more that I forget. Um, my hard drive is not that big. <laughs> but they're pushing for that to be added to the uh, SI system, right? The standard metric system will have a nor NorCalism in it, the Hella byte. <sighs> yada, yeah, so after Yada, I think would be Hella. Um, anyhow, all right, so. Uh, yeah, some systems, though, don't use 8-bit bytes. They use... Uh, DSP systems can have 256-bit bytes. Um, and so this this is preferable. If you're if you're going to be... If you're going to be making... Um, like, any time I, I make an integer, I'm, I'm either going to make, you know... 8-bit eight, eight int, unsigned 8-bit int, int 64-t, 64-bit int. Things like that, because I don't, because the C++ language is written to be fast. It is not written to be uh, portable, which is unfortunate. Java is much more portable than C++, because in Java, an int is always 32 bits. In C++, an int, an int does not have to be 32 bits. Uh, C++ defaults to what's called int fast, which is actually a type. Uh, I think it's like int underscore fast, something like that. Uh, you, you don't need to write it ever or know it. Because int means int fast. And so that means pick an integer type that matches the register size. And so if you have 32-bit registers, ints will be 32 bits. If you're on a 64-bit system, uh, it, oftentimes it'll still be 32 bits because it'll break compatibility. But like that's technically what it means. If you're on a 16-bit system, your ints will be 16 bits. And so ints are usually 32 bits. And nowadays it's kind of become standard like because if you were to change it at this point it'd just break everything you know um but there's no guarantee in the c++ language how big an int is there's a minimum 
of 16 and a maximum, I think, of 64 or something like that, if there is one. But it, there's sort of a de facto standard, but it's not guaranteed. And I have I have personally run code on systems that used 16-bit ints, not anything recently. It was a long ass time ago. But your code breaks. Your code breaks when you move to one of those systems. Because, you know, you used to have a high score that could range from zero to, you know, two million. You know, and uh, and now the high score is limited to 65,536. You're like, what? And, and your high score wraps around past that point, and it's stupid. All right, so anyway, so an 8-bit an eight bit char, unsigned 8-bit char ranges from 0 to 255. A signed 8-bit char ranges from negative 128. So this is an unsigned uh, int 8t uint. Unsigned int eight t, uh, and then a signed, a signed um, eight bit char, just a char, you know, basically, um, is not you, int eight t. Notice I'm not using char because there's no guarantee, right? I like having guarantees with my code. I like my code to not run differently on different systems because one of the things I used to do professionally was port code from one system to another and oh lord it is a pain in the ass let me tell you let me tell you how big a pain in the ass it is to port between different similar but also very different uh, operating systems it is a pain and so I like my code to be portable and that matters oftentimes more to me than speed and uh if, if speed is important, then you just pick the type that is right for your system anyway, that you're gonna be primarily running on. Um, I, there's very few circumstances where I'd want an integer to be 32 bits on one system and 64 on another. It's like, you know, maybe, maybe, but it's rare. Because normally you know about how big your, your range of numbers is gonna be. And so you, you just set the size to that. Um, technically, a 32-bit integer can be slower on a 64-bit system. So maybe using int fast is going to be better. It's possible. Uh, but rare. But rare. Okay. So thumb is 16 bits. Yeah. Thumb is 16 bits. Yeah. Okay. So how do we do negative numbers? So a lot of students think that if you do a, a negative number, You've got like a sign bit, like a plus or minus bit. And then, uh, you know, if it's I don't know, one, it's positive, And if it's zero, it's negative or, or vice versa. And then all the other bits are the same, right? So it'd be, what does that be? 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Nope, no 128. Just a sign bit, right? Because you got eight bits. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so if we want to represent negative 64, uh, let's say that uh, negative is zero, then it would look like this, right? Or the sign bit, it, it doesn't really matter, it's arbitrary. And so this would mean negative 64. Are you guys with me so far? And if I wanted positive 64, then I would make that a one. It's positive 64, congratulations, right? Uh, so it's not done this way. And the reason why it's not done this way is because you lose, well, there's actually several good reasons why it's not done this way. But the, the most obvious answer is what number is this? What number is this? You guys got it right. It's negative zero. <laughs> and what number is this? It's positive zero. Now, that's a problem, right? Because you've wasted essentially one of your numbers, right? So rather than being able to have 256 possible integers, there's now 255 because uh, your dumbass has both positive zero and negative zero, right? Now, now this sounds weird, but some 
formats, some numeric formats actually have both a positive zero and a negative zero. That's actually done in floating point. Once you get into the IEEE, you know, floating point formats, um, they actually will have a positive and a negative zero, and there's reasons for that. Uh, but there's the, those reasons don't really apply to the integer world, right? Uh, the base position was negative, default negative zero. <laughs> um, but this, this, if you do the system, the the biggest number you can represent uh, in this system is 127, and the lowest number positive 127, and the lowest number you can represent is negative 127, right? Whereas we want the full range, we want to be able to go from negative 128 to positive 127. So, how do we do that? Well. This, my students, is a very, very, very important learning point, okay? This is something you gotta know if you're a computer science major. Um, it's, part of, it's part of the literacy of being a computer science major. Uh, this is something called two's complement. Two's complement. And it's basically how everybody does signed integers. Okay, so you got all this, the highest bit is not a sign bit. The highest bit is negative 128. Okay. So whenever you have a signed integer, all of that happens if it to <laughs> an unsigned integer would look like this, right? But with a signed integer, whatever the highest bit is, just the highest bit, not anymore, just the highest bit, only whatever the most significant bit is, the biggest bit. So on a 32-bit system, it's the one on the very far left. On a 64-bit system, it's the one on the very far left is a negative number of whatever it should have been. Okay, so on an 8-bit system, it's 128. So in two's complement, it is negative 128, and that's it. And now, you, now all the binary stuff works the same. So, um, what number is this? Yeah, negative 128. Now let's add one to it. Watch this. You can't do this with a sign bit, right? Because the sign bit doesn't really take part in arithmetic. Let's add one to it. What number do we get? We get a negative 128 plus one, which is negative 127. So arithmetic actually works the same way in two's complement as it does in signed arithmetic. That's why I told you the registers don't know and they don't care if they have signed numbers in them or unsigned numbers in them because uh, you keep adding ones to this and it'll start counting up. Like let's say we add, uh, let's say we add 64 to it. You just, you know, you just, uh, you just do the arithmetic and it just works. You can just mix signed numbers and unsigned numbers and, um, I mean, like a small sign number, and, it, and it'll just work. This is, this number is now a negative 64, right? This number is negative 64. It just, it just works. Everything works magically. Okay. Yep. Uh, but what about overflow? Hmm. Good question, good question. What happens if we add What happens if we add negative 128 to negative 128? One plus one is 10, right? One gets carried out. So the carry, the carry register, not to be confused with the curry register, the curry register is completely different. Uh, the carry register uh, will carry the one out, but basically you'll end up with uh, zero, right? So if you, if you add negative 128 and negative 128 together, right? Negative 128 is the smallest number you can represent. They will add together to form zero. It'll actually just underflow, wrap around, become zero. So, it's actually pretty, pretty reasonable. Um, if you subtract one from negative 128, you get 127. If you add one to 127, you get negative 128. Uh, they, they, it overflows and it wraps around to the bottom. It underflows and wraps around to the top. Um, and that's actually expected behavior. It, it didn't used to be a defined behavior uh, until 2020. Um, 2020 added, I think, 
obtuse complement as finally the default arithmetic system for C++. Because before, um, if you had any operations that could overflow or underflow, the compiler was free to say that's undefined behavior and do something completely different. And so some optimizers had the option of just cutting your code out. Why? Because you're adding two ints together. <laughs> right? You, <laughs> that's not good, right? Because if you add two ints together, if there is no guarantee those ints won't overflow or underflow, the, the optimizer is actually within its power to be like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just not going to handle that and delete the code. Right? Or delete the code if the numbers are big or something like that. Right? Uh, yeah, so let's let's add um, let's add negative 128 and 127 together. So this is 100 negative 128 plus uh, sorry. So let's add this is negative 128 and let's add it to 127 and so we should get negative one, right? So uh, it's important for you guys to know what negative one looks like because it's pretty famous. Uh, negative one, negative one is one, 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 one. Yeah, no, no compilers in practice did that because uh, there would be a riot, <laughs> you know, because nobody likes hearing that their their integers adding two ints is undefined behavior, <laughs> right? But it is because if if you don't specify what happens when two ints overflow then, and it's on the standard, then technically that's undefined behavior and the compiler can start playing the Macarena and that would be correct. And so um, the the people finally just kind of looked at all the CPUs out there and they're like, okay, literally nobody is doing anything different than two's complement. So we're gonna make that the standard. But for a long time, they didn't make it the standard because they wanted the possibility to exist for non two's complement CPUs to exist, right? And because uh, any C++ program on a non twos complement system will now be garbage because it would have to convert to and from twos complement every time it does an add. But since those CPUs don't exist, they're like, eh, screw it. So uh, negative one is all ones. Okay. And this is true for eight bits, 16 bits, 32 bits, 64 bits. If I, if I give you a 64 bit number and it's all ones, and I tell you that's a signed, a signed 64-bit integer. If I tell you that is an int 64t, and I hand you 64 ones all in a row, and I'm like, do the math. What is it? You just like negative one, right? Negative one. You don't have to add. Uh, you you don't have to do the arithmetic to add 64 different bits together. All ones in, in two's complement is always negative one. Sounds like a good test question, sure. And if I wanted to make it a little bit more challenging, um, what number is this? So I just took I just took negative one and I subtracted two from it. So what number is this? Yeah, it's negative three. Because I just took negative one and I Took negative one minus two is negative three. And I could do this. I could turn this bit off. I just subtracted out 16. And so this number is now a negative 19. You guys understand? So be able to, you should be able to work backwards also from negative one, right? So negative one is all ones. And so if I turn off like one bit, you should just be able to go down to it. Um, negative one plus, negative one plus one overflows all those bits and uh, um, turns into zero. So if I give you negative one, which is all ones again, if I give you negative one and I add one to it, So this is negative one plus one, then um, the answer is gonna be zero, right? So what happens is that one plus one is 10, one plus one is 10, one plus one is 10. And so the one will 
kind of carry all the way out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then the carry bit will be set to be one as well. Okay. We normally ignore the carry bit, but there is there is like branch if carry set, and there's also branch if carry clear. And you can use those if you want to do a 64-bit math, right? So like if you add two 32-bit integers together, you can check to see if the carry is set, or you can check to see if the carry is clear. And then you can add that into the upper 32 bits. So if you're gonna do 64-bit arithmetic, you do the bottom 32 bits, and then you bring the carry bit over into the upper 32 bits and you add those together. So it takes you um, two or three cycles to do um, to do 64-bit math instead of 32-bit math on a 32-bit system. Um, you do, what would it be, add, add if carry set, or you can do add if carry clear. And you can add one to the, to the number if the carry set. Okay, so that is called two's complement. That is our primary learning point for today. Um, it's a very important concept. Um, you know, you go to CPPCon, you know, I went to CPPCon in 2017, 2018, and people are like, why is two's complement not the standard? Why is it unsigned behavior to do signed arithmetic? And they're like, yeah, yeah, got a point. <laughs> and so now it's finally in the standard, right? And and again, if you guys ever try printing out these 8-bit numbers, it will get converted to ASCII. And so if, so if you've got your uh, unsigned 8-bit uh, unsigned integer named X and you try C outing it and you want it to come out as a number, C out it converted to int, right? You guys with me? So if, if you have an unsigned 8-bit integer, even though you've explicitly said, I don't want this to be a char, I want it to be an unsigned 8-bit number. This is an unsigned 8-bit number. It's not a char. Don't matter. Don't matter. C++ will output it as using ASCII encoding. So rather than outputting, you know, negative 1 or what would that be, 127, whatever that is on the ASCII table, uh, it will... Uh, Uh, the delete key, right? If you were to output the number 127, um, it'd print the delete key. So, um, I don't know if you guys can see that. Let me scroll over and redo this with better handwriting because it's actually really important because a lot of students, when they work with these things, they're like, uh, my numbers aren't printing. And yeah, it's it's just due to the fact that it's um, it's stupid. <laughs> I am making, why do I keep writing these letters backwards? I am making an unsigned 8-bit integer named X and I'm setting it equal to 127. And I'm now gonna see out it. If you were to write code like this, this would print the delete key to the screen. <laughs> right, it'll erase, it'll erase a letter. Maybe. You know, so if you want to actually print the number 127, you cast it to an integer. And there's different ways of casting things. This is the, this is one way of casting it to an integer. Uh, another way would be um, int x like that. That'll cast it to an integer. The most proper way of doing it is static underscore cast angle bracket and oh look I've run out of room parentheses x close parentheses so that's the proper way of doing it it also gives you carpal tunnel so you know you do you uh, this version where you do int in parentheses that's called a c style cast this is a c style c style cast here and int like that it's technically calling a constructor on the int class so to speak it's not really class but that's the C++ constructor notation. It constructs an integer using X. Um, this is the most proper way of doing it, but it's also like really verbose to type, which I, I'm, I'm really not a fan of how verbose C++ has gone. It's like a lot of, a whole generation of people grew up doing 
uh, Java. And Java is one of the most verbose languages. Java is like 10 times longer than it needs to be for like literally anything. And so all these people grew up taking Java classes in their intro classes. And then they joined the standards committee, apparently. I don't know. And started adding all these stupidly long names. Uh, Static Cast isn't actually the, the, the worst defender. Like iterators, I think, have the longest dumb names of any of the standard stuff. But, um, yeah. Uh, no, this, these, these two things work fine. The, the main the main advantage of static cast is that you could control F for it, you know? Like, you can actually search for, find all the places where I'm static casting, you know? Whereas when you do this, it'll just turn up every, if you search for int, you know, it'll it'll turn up, like, ints, right? So, the, the, the main benefit of static cast is that your tool, your tooling can find every instance of, of a cast or something like that. It's usually not significant. Public static void main string args, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're required to include command line arguments in Java. Yeah, I, one thing I wish they would do in C++ is this int uh, int main um, vector, right? Vector of strings named args, something like that. So you can get your command line parameters in a vector rather than through the C, C style, you know, where you have a char star star, right? <laughs> you've, you've got uh, int arg C, which is how many args there are. And then you've got a pointer to a pointer of characters named arg V. And uh, yeah, if 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 they could just like allow this instead, that'd be cool. That'd be really neat. They, um, yeah. Whole point of modern C plus plus is not having to work with pointers, and like right out of the gate, they they hit you with a star star, right? It's a pointer. It's it's an array of strings, is what it is. It's an array of strings. But yeah, that's just me complaining for no particular reason. You can cast uh, between the two. You can you can make your own vector if it matters to you, I guess. Okay. All right. Um, I, I just wish it had better support out of the gate. All right. Uh, so that's two's complement. Uh, any, any questions about it? Basically, if you were doing a 32-bit number, uh, whatever the highest number is up there, uh, like negative... Uh, what is it? Two left shifted 31 times. 4.2 billion is the maximum. This is the maximum integer for an unsigned 32 bit. And so divided by two. So it's like 2.1 billion and change. Like I said, when I, when I took this class, we had to memorize this number, which, um, I kind of swore a holy oath. I didn't really, but to not make you guys memorize what the maximum minimum numbers are. Because like if your code is like playing up against these boundaries, like, well, we know their their high score will probably not be any higher than 2.05 billion. <laughs> yeah. You're doing something wrong, right? You you're, you're whatever numbers you're holding should not ever get near the limit. Or they're gonna start overflowing unexpectedly when you're doing math. And you're adding two numbers together and things like that. It'll overflow unexpectedly. But uh, yeah, so what that means is that in two's complement, the highest uh, for 32-bit numbers for what happened here for a 32-bit signed number. Are you guys all familiar with what signed versus unsigned means? Signed means it's got positive and negatives. Okay. So 32-bit signed number, which is an int 32t. Uh, would the top bit would be negative two, you know, whatever. I'm not gonna write the whole thing. Negative two point one billion, right? And then the next bit would be one point oh five billion, and the next bit would be, you know, five hundred million and change, right? And so only with two's complement, only the very highest bit is um, negative, and all the other numbers are the same. And when you add 
unsigned numbers together, it just works. You can add a small signed number and a unsigned number together and it works. Um, yeah, it, it, it's just, it's a very nice system and it just works smoothly. You can just add them and um, honestly, the, the, the CPU doesn't need to know most of the time if you're talking about a signed number or an unsigned number. Now, when does it matter? When do you need to know if this number is positive or negative, right? If it was unsigned, this would be a positive, right? What operation actually cares if a number is positive or negative? What do you guys think? Division. Division. Never heard of it. <laughs> this, this is ARM32, guys. There, there's no such thing as division. I mean, there is, but... Uh, we haven't talked about it yet. It's not part. Of, it's not part of the uh, core core uh, assembly language. Uh, LSR, uh, yeah. So uh, two actually actually two correct answers here. So uh, one of them is when you do a shift right, okay, and the other one is when you do multiplies, right. So if you were to be multiplying, um, if you were to be multiplying numbers together. You need to know, you need to know uh, if this is a positive 128 or a negative 128, right? Because it's going to, it's going to affect the, the outcome, right? So if, uh, um, you know, is this number here, oops, is this number here negative one or is it 127, <laughs> right? So with multiply, there is a uh, moles multiply signed, right? Uh, which will do a sign multiplication. And so, so you, you basically have to tell the CPU at the time you're doing the multiply, is this number a signed number or is it an unsigned number? And, um, and that's it. For most of the time, uh, it's completely agnostic. Most operations, ands and ors and nots and adds and subtracts, None of them care, but uh, when when it does come time to multiply, it needs to know is it negative one or is it one twenty seven because those are two very different numbers, right? And uh, you know if, if I was to multiply one by negative one, then it would turn all these things into ones, and if I was to multiply one by one twenty seven, well, it would also turn into ones, huh? Wouldn't it? Um, maybe it matters. Maybe it doesn't matter. Should matter. Seems like it should matter. Okay. Um, the thing that I was thinking of though was for shifting. So for shifting, you need to know if it's a signed or an unsigned number. If you're doing an arithmetic shift, right? Like if, if you're if you're using if you're using a shift as a, a division operator, you need to know this. And um, like you guys saw, it is possible for um, it is possible to do division by shifting, right? So if I were to take, uh, if I were to take a number, if I were to take a number, like 42, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, which is the number 42. And if I wanted to divide it by 4, if I wanted to do 42 divided by 4, I don't need a divide instruction in ARM32. I don't need to go into the textbook. The textbook has a program that's like, I don't know, 80 lines long, that'll actually do division for you. Uh, and again, you, you need to know if it's signed or unsigned when you're doing division, right? Because you know, dividing the sign gets preserved through, through division. Um, there's a loop tool in the top left that lets you highlight sections of writing and delete it all at once, neat. Um, okay, so uh, so if I want to do division by four, though, that's just shifting right by two, right? So if I did a shift right by two, then this number would get divided by four. So when you do a shift, all the bits just march single file off the cliff to the right, if I do a right shift. And so um, this bit goes, Aye! and falls off the cliff. Uh, so these two guys are going to go away. They they fall off the cliff, and then what we're left with is um, uh, 
1010. So originally it was 101010. All the bits march to the right. That's the that's the real question that we'll get to in a second. But basically, if you look at this, the answer is 10, right? Uh, 42 divided by 4 is 10 in the integer world, right? It should be 10 and a half because that 2's bit should have come here, right? But there is no half bit in integer world. There isn't float world. Spoilers. Um, so 42 divided by 4 is 10. Yeah, if you guys want to know how floating point works, there's a half bit, there's a quarter bit. little teaser for the future. Um, and so basically a right shift will do division, or a right shift of two bits will do division by, by four. But you need to know if this number is signed or unsigned. Because if, um, if this was a negative number, if we had a negative number here, like let's say negative 128, Negative 128 divided by 4 is 30, negative 32, right? Right? But uh, if that number was instead 128 divided by 4, then it would be 32. So what, what would that look like in bit terms? Okay? In bit terms, negative 32 and 32 don't look very similar. That's negative 32. This is positive 32. See the difference? So if we started with 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and we right shifted, you need to know if that number is a signed number or an unsigned number. If it's an unsigned number, you just do what's called a logical shift right. A logical shift right always fills in zeros, right? So zero, so the, the one that was here marches two to the right to here and it fills in zeros. If it's a signed number, you instead do arithmetic shift right, which always fills in, what do you guys think? The arithmetic shift right. ones? Nope. It always fills in the high bit. So if what was there before was a zero, like if you had 32, this is a perfectly valid signed number. 32 is a valid signed number. If I did an arithmetic shift right, it would become eight. This would become a zero, this would become a one. It, and, all the, and it would fill in zeros. So arithmetic shift right fills in whatever number was in the high bit position. So whatever, whatever number is here, whatever number is here gets filled in to, filled in to make up the missing bits. Okay, so when that, when that number gets shifted right twice, it's going to fill in a 1 each time. But if there was a 0 there before, if there was a 0 there before, and it was like 64, then, and you did a right shift once, the one in the 64 position would become a 32, and it would fill in a new zero from the left. You guys understand? So with uh, arithmetic shift right, whatever bit, is, whatever bit is here, this is the key. Whatever bit is there gets copied to the right. With a logical shift right, it always fills in zeros. Okay. Is there a difference between arithmetic shift right and logical shift right if you're shifting the number ten? Let's say let's say you want to let's say you want to shift the number ten right one space. Is there any difference between giving the LSR and the ASR command? 
Could I do some examples? Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Is there any difference between LSR and ASR if I'm shifting the number 10 right uh, one time or two times or four times? No, because the high bit is zero. When the high bit is zero, there is absolutely no difference between ASR and LSR. Okay. Because it always fills in the high bit. If the high bit is zero, then they're the exact same thing. So for any number between uh, zero and 127, LSR and ASR will work this, the same. The difference is if the high bit is set, the the uh, computer needs to know the computer needs to know if it needs to know if this high bit means negative 128 or if it means positive 128. Okay, because if it if it means positive 128. 128 divided by 2, bloop, bloop. 128 divided by 2 is 64. The bit moves to the right, it fills in a 0. That's LSR. LSR is unsigned. ASR is for signed numbers. It needs to know, it needs to know in that circumstance. Okay. So if, uh, if the number is just 128, 128 divided by 2 is 64. The bit moves to the right, fills the 0 in, everything's golden. Okay. Um, now, if this number was negative, though, negative 128 divided by 2 is negative 64. And so this bit here will move to the right, and it will fill a 1 in instead, because the high bit was 1 before. And so negative 128 divided by 2 is negative 64. This number here is negative 64. Okay. Using LSR guarantees a positive number. ASR, yeah, ASR works with both positive and negative numbers, right? Because remember, an assigned integer can, can be positive. You can have 10 or you can have negative 10, right? It, it, it just needs to know when this bit is set, does that mean a positive number or a negative number? Because it actually makes a difference to the, to the result. Negative 10 divided by 2 is 5. Neg negative 5. 10 divided by 2 is 5. Negative 10 divided by 2 is negative 5. Okay. Um, how do you convert from 10 to negative 10? Let's say you want to do times negative 1. What is negative 10 in 2's complement? So there's a couple different ways you can figure this. Easiest way is to start at negative 1 and go down by 9, right? <laughs> so this is negative 1. And if you want to go down by 9, that would be that, right? So that's negative 10. Yep. So how do you multiply this by negative 1? Isn't there an algorithm? Because 10 is close to that, but, you know, this is 10, right? It's close. It's, it looks like most of the bits are flipped, right? Most of the bits are flipped, but not, not these two. Is there a pattern? Is there a pattern? Yes, there is. I'll give you that. I'll give that to you. There is a pattern. There is a rule. So uh, this is also the kind of thing that I, I ask on worksheets. So how do you convert from negative 10 to 10, right? In other words, how do you multiply by negative 1? And uh, you guys ready to learn the trick? Step 1. Flip the bits. Flip the bits. <laughs> Step two, add one. Yeah. 
Yeah, the algorithm is uh, bit twiddle all the bits and then add one to it. That's how you multiply by negative one. It's much faster than doing multiply, right? It's one one cycle instead of maybe two if you have to not it first or whatever. Yep. So flip all the bits, add one. So let's let's run through through some examples. Okay. Um, So here we've got negative 10, right? That's negative 10. This is negative 10. And we want to multiply it by negative 1. So you start off by flipping the bits 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. And you add 1 to it. So that turns into 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, which, as it turns out, is 10. Wonder if the optimizer does that whenever you multiply by negative one. Probably. Yeah, it seems like a really easy pickup. Um, to God bolt. <laughs> to God bolt. Let's find out if the optimizer picks that up. Such a great tool. I mean, it's nothing you couldn't do on your own by compiling code with a negative. Uh, S or dash S, uh, but you know it's just so nice. Okay, so int main hello world dance. Um, int x cn into x. So we can't optimize because if you put a number in there, it's going to optimize it away, right? So we'll read a. We'll, we're going to read a. Uh, we're going to read an integer. And then we're going to say x is equal to x times minus 1. Or if we want to be super elite coder dude, x times equals negative 1, and then we'll return x. Okay. So also it can't, it can't eliminate the... Um, let me clean up the window here. Ah, oh, this thing's all ugly. Okay, here we go. Uh, yep, okay. And let's do modern a modern compiler. Arm GCC nine two one. Uh, why is this thing so hard to read? Uh, oh, C plus plus ninety eight. No, no, no. C plus plus C plus plus two A dash O three. Uh, we don't need warnings. We don't care about warnings. Okay. Okay. There we go. So um, it looks like it inlined CN maybe. Let's see. Load the address L four. Uh, no, it didn't. Okay. All right. So it is. Uh, it is going to zoom in again. Okay. So here is main. Uh, stack pointer moves down, adds four to the stack pointer, saves that into R1, which isn't used for much. Uh, this is called right before add exit. Okay. So move R4 into R0. So uh, R4 gets moved into R0. Move R4 into R0. BX. RSB reverse subtract. Okay, so yeah, the optimizer, the optimizer actually does not do a bit twiddle like that. What it does is it does a reverse subtract, right? And so what it's doing, it's subtracting the number from zero, right? So if you had five, zero minus five is negative five. So it does, um, it does subtraction, which is one cycle, which is faster than a cycle to bit twiddle and a cycle to add one. So. That's how that's how the optimizer would um, handle it, a multiply by negative one. Now, if I was to multiply by uh, what line is that? Eight. Let's multiply it by negative eleven. Then, aha! <laughs> it figured it out. Also, do you see that? So it subtracts uh, <laughs> the number left shifted left twenty eight times adding the number left shifted twice. So it's, it's doing algebra to figure out a way of, of speeding up the, uh, the multiply. It's funny. 
Multiply by negative 111. No, still figure it out. Multiplied by nah, some large number. I'm going to make it too hard for you, compiler. Yes, finally. Okay, cool. So finally it gives up on trying to optimize that away and uh, doesn't multiply, right? If it takes too many steps, it will not replace the multiply with adds. Uh, one of the optimizers who does that whenever we multiply by a negative one. Uh, big brain compiler, yeah. And so, yeah, compilers are really good at figuring this stuff out. Now, you can turn that off, maybe, maybe turn that off, if we do dash O S. Is it lowercase s or capital S? I don't remember. Lowercase s looks like it works. Does capital S work? It does not work. Okay, it's lowercase s. Okay, right, so if you compile it with dash lowercase s, then what it's going to do, it's going to do a space optimization. So let's see if that will turn off the um, optimization. Yes, you see that? So because we um, are multiplying by negative 11, uh, it is doing a multiply here rather than the three adds that it was doing before. And the reason why it's not doing it now is because I turned on dash o lowercase s, which is a optimizer setting you've probably not seen before but will make sense to you now because you know what caches are okay so dash lowercase uh, dash o lowercase s t means optimize the space of the program optimize you can say the um the executable size uh, optimize how few lines of assembly you have which is not the same thing as make running speed faster Right, so what we saw before was the the compiler uh, would replace one multiply with three adds, right? Because that's still three cycles instead of four, right? But it made your program go from one line of code to three lines of code in assembly. That can matter sometimes. Usually, it doesn't matter in a small program like this. It absolutely will not matter. the The original optimizer dash o three, which is the highest setting of optimizers, usually. Um, is usually going to be faster, but if you dash if you dash o lowercase s, then it tries to minimize the number of lines of code, which is not the same thing as minimizing running time. Why would you do that? Well, if your code is bigger than the L1 cache for instructions, then you're going to be getting cache misses left and right. You'll be getting cache misses left and right on your every instruction you're on, let's say. Let's say you're doing uh, this giant, I don't know, loop that's I don't know, a megabyte in size. Uh, and, it, and it keeps doing it over and over again. The L1 cache can't hold a megabyte of code. And a megabyte's really not that big if you think about it. Like, you know, think about how complicated um, uh, World of Warcraft is, right? The, the, the thing is, the way the caches work is whatever is hot, Whatever you're using a lot of is going to be in cache. And then when you branch to something new, you're going to start getting cache misses. And But then when you get into a loop over there, it'll start getting cache hits and things like that. Um, and hopefully it's all in like L2 cache or L3 cache. Um, but here's the thing. Like if you're doing a hot loop and your hot loop that you're doing over and over again, millions of times a second, if your hot loop is bigger than that 16K or whatever it is, L1 cache limit, you're going to start cache missing left and right. And rather than it, taking essentially no cycles it'll be taking like let's say 20 cycles per line of code and so your code will start running like 20 times slower than it should and so one thing that people will try is they'll do dash o lowercase s and that will try to minify the size of the program and then if your program goes from being bigger than cache to fitting within cache that might actually speed up the code more than dash o3 dash o3 will make your program bigger in order to make it faster but with memory effects with cache effects making it bigger is not always better and that's why when you that's why when we talked about inlining functions last time uh inlining is not always good because it makes your code bigger and once your code starts getting bigger it might not fit into cache anymore and so the the compiler kind of uses some guesses as to like when it should inline something inlining again means you take the assembly you take the assembly for a function and you just paste it into your code because then you don't have to write to 
push and pop and all, all that other, you don't have any of the overhead. And so, um, uh, the, the, the compiler by default just kind of guesses, you know, but it doesn't really have, um, the same kind of knowledge you have. And so, yeah, I, I have used dash OS, uh, before. Oh, oh yeah. It's dash O lowercase s dash O lowercase s is, uh, and, and so what that does is it, um, uh, optimizing your code oftentimes will make your code smaller, right? And so what it does is it turns off, it turns off the optimizations that make your code bigger. So it, it doesn't actually try to minify your code. What it does is it optimizes your code and then doesn't do the optimizations like inlining or replacing a multiply with three ads that make your code bigger. So it, it, it does, it does most of the optimization. So it does make your code faster. Like if I were to make this negative one, right? This should turn into a, a reverse subtract, right? Right here. Yeah, see, it'll do that one because that was a one-to-one -one sub substitution. The multiply becomes a reverse subtract. So it'll do it if it doesn't make the, the code bigger. You understand? And so if, and if I were to do something like this where I'm just like um, setting x equal to 42, then you will see the um, the um, optimizer uh, basically. Uh, what is that like? <laughs> like those things that curve like that, right there. The curly braces. Yeah. Um, it's saying uh, write these two things into into memory into RAM, and so you can see the optimizer is now it optimized all that code away, and this is with dash OS on right space optimization, and um, and it'll do it because it it shrunk the code. It'll do optimizations that keep the code the same or smaller, but it won't do the optimizations that make the code bigger. Are you guys with me on this? And and the reason why um, we do this is because of cache, because of memory hierarchy. And none of this would make any sense until you've taken this class. That's why this class is so important. It's not like at your job, you're gonna be doing worksheets with cache lines and things like that, but you gotta know about caching or um, your code is gonna be uh, like, like you just you have to understand it in order to write good code. Um, ca dash capital O lowercase s. Yeah. How can we modify the dash O on the server for your assignments? Uh, by default, your your thing has dash O three on, which is the best one. You you can turn on dash O S for the uh, the if assignment, but the code is small. Like it's this big. It's you you have sixteen kilobytes or. Of, of L1 cache, like you're, you're not going to need it. But uh, Shami, to answer your question, um, um, when doing parallel processing, um, let's say you've got a program, you got this big 2D array, it's a billion by a billion, it's a giant, giant array filled with numbers. And you're going to go through it and you're going to average, uh, you're going to set each point to be the average of its neighbors. Very common kind of thing to do. It's technically like a solver for an ordinary differential equation, things like that. Um, if you if you did it in, um, if you did it on one CPU, if you did it on one CPU, let's, uh, Use the galaxy pin. There we go. Because it's so big, it's galactic in size, right? So we got a billion rows this way, and we got a billion or billion columns that way, and a, and a billion rows this way. And so it's a billion times a billion, which is a quadrillion elements. Nah, whatever. It's a gargantuan array. Um, if you start, you know, processing this array left to right like you normally do, um, when you when you are here, let's say, it reads the value below it, it reads the value to the right of it, it reads the value to the left of it, and it reads the value above it. Okay, so the values to the left and the right are probably in cache. You're you're probably going to get a cache hit on those. Uh, the value below is not going to be in cache, and the value above is not going to be in cache. So you're going to cache miss above and below. Okay, and so that's going to slow, and that's going to be straight to RAM, right, uh, or hard drive. If it's that big, it's probably on a hard drive, right? Uh, and so you're talking about like a 10,000 to 1 million times slowdown, right? 
because you're hitting you're going to hear the hard drive spinning uh, because by the time you get to the end over here and you start working on the next row all of those things are out of cache already because you've just gone through four gigs of ram essentially and nobody's got four gigs of cache and i'm close right you might have like I don't know, 100 megs of cache or some crazy system right but not nobody's got four gigs of cache right and so by the time you start working on the next row by the time you get to the next row all of the things in the row above it uh, are gone right they're, they're out of cache already so you're going to cache miss over and over again and if your system has enough ram at least it'll be in ram but probably not this is probably gonna be hitting hard drive and so you're going to be talking like a million times slower than it should okay so um so how do we handle that in high performance computing and why why does knowing caching matter well uh let me let me show you let me give you two examples uh first of all uh, when you're reading through ram like that it's going to start knocking your program out of cache out of l2 cache um and so if your program fits within l1 cache you, there's something called the modified harvard architecture which is um that the l2 cache is shared but the l1 cache is split you have your instruction cache and you have your data cache and then the l2 and the l3 are unified it's called princeton or von neumann architecture and uh then you have ram right and so your i cache and your d cache are separate and so what's happening is that you're flowing uh you know terabytes of data from the hard drive uh from the hard drive into ram into l3 into l2 into l1 and all this data is just going to be knocking everything out of there it's like a tidal wave just coming through and just bulldozing all the cache and so you really want your program to be able to hide within this within this cache here right <laughs> so you you want to make sure your program the whole damn thing ideally will fit within the l1 cache does that make sense so um are you writing this all with the mouse yeah i'm i am amazing with the mouse look at how look at how good i am at writing with the mouse um does that make sense shammy um i i know i've got a tablet i got a i got a wake on because i'm a professional youtuber now so i am streaming live using my tablet um yeah so so basically um that's that's one of the things you look at is like <laughs> Because if your program is like 20k, you know, and the cache is 16k, then uh, you can start having to hit hard drive every time you try to do the next assembly instruction, and it could be bad. So it's just one of the things you look at. Does that make sense? So uh, you you might try it, and you, you try it, and you're like, okay, it made no difference. Go back to dash o three, right? So some like you'll use dash o three by default uh, almost across the board, but. If, if you if you think you're running into caching issues then you'll try dash o lowercase s and um and just see you know because why not like that's again these things oftentimes become too hard to just um know if it's going to be faster because you know maybe dash o3 had some really important optimizations that os wasn't doing they would make it faster even if the code was getting cache misses sometimes maybe the better code performance from o3 will counter counterweigh those advantages you know and it, it, it's just it's too hard to just eyeball you know and no and so what you do is you uh at, at two o'clock okay you got it and and so like share comment subscribe hit that bell subscribe to the patreon um my daughter's laughing in the background um and and so we'll just experiment we'll just experiment we'll try it that and that and that's one of the reasons why this is called computer science it's called computer science because we run experiments and we're like what's going to be faster and um a lot of times you don't know because it's so complicated you got millions of lines of code and this data set's gargantuan and you, you know it's just too high to our eyeballs so you just compile it once run it compile it a different way run it be like oh wow look that one you know uh, i thought this was going to make a difference but it didn't so we don't use it or Contrawise, wow, uh, by using dash OS, um, we were able to fit in cache when we weren't before. So, you know, it's, it's just one of those things. And so you, so you try it, it's, it's, a good, it's a good tool to have in your toolbox. Now, another thing we do in high performance computing is uh, we will split it up into different CPUs. And so what, 
what that has the effect of sometimes is actually getting a, a hyperlinear performance. So, um, so normally, um, normally there is kind of a, a we we graph this. This is the number of CPUs, and this is the running time. And so normally what you want to see is as the number of CPUs goes up, you know, when you go to, you know, let's start off, yeah, that's one CPU, let's say, two CPUs, three, four, five. What you want to see is if the runtime was 100 seconds, when you go to two CPUs, it goes to 50 seconds, and three CPUs goes to 20, uh, sorry, 33 seconds, and with four CPUs, it goes to 25 seconds, right? So this would be a linear speed up, right? Where basically you get in performance out of in CPUs. That rarely happens. And the reason why it rarely happens is because usually the CPUs have to communicate with each other. And the more CPUs you have, the more communication, the, the less speed up you get. And so there's usually like a, a point at which the running time starts going back up, right? So like maybe at six CPUs, it's actually worse than five CPUs because there's so much, you know, Ethernet action going on that it actually takes longer than to just keep keep it on one CPU. And so that's part of the experimentation you do when you do high performance computing. You're like, that's the right size, five, you know? And then you run all of your experiments using five CPUs. Okay. And it's different for every program, for every workload. And so you'll you'll run you'll run these things uh for like this is for data, you know. A one gigabyte data set and then it might be different for like a two gigabyte data set now one really interesting thing that can happen though is that you get hyperlinear performance so in other words rather than getting like a two times speed up for two cpus you you might actually get like a three times speed up for two cpus and you're like that should be impossible right do you guys understand what i'm saying so when you move from one cpu to two cpus the the maximum performance you expect to ever see is about two or like 1.99, right? But sometimes you get three times performance. And you're like, that's impossible, right? Uh, Mr. Devella has it right. What happens is that you got more cash on two CPUs than you got on one CPU. So let's say that um, let's say that this data set here is 20 megs total, right? If you split it into two different sections, this 10 megabyte section here and this 10 megabyte section here. Uh, and your CPU, let's say, has 13 megs of L3 cache. And this CPU has 13 megs of L3 cache. Then what can happen is that before, this was hammering RAM. And now it fits nicely into L3 cache on both of them. And so you're getting cache hits instead of cache misses. For all of them, over and over again. And so, that's, uh, so you can actually see um, better than the theoretical maximum performance because of memory hierarchy. And, and that's why that's why I keep saying this, but it's, it's actually really important to understand caching because even though you're not going to be doing worksheets and cache simulators, maybe you will, but probably not in your professional career, you have to understand how this works because otherwise you're going to be baffled. You're like, two CPUs is faster than two CPUs. Uh, what? You know, and then, and then you're like, let's try three CPUs. And now it gets four times performance. You're like, all right, let's try a hundred CPUs. No, that only gets six times performance. Wait, huh? You know, and so, um, and so, you, you know, there, there's a lot of confusion that takes place if you don't understand this memory hierarchy from hard drive to RAM to L3 to L2 to L1. Okay. And uh, the smaller sections are more cache friendly. That's exactly right. That's... That's in fact the terminology we use. We, we, we use the term cache friendly. And so you wanna write code that is cache friendly. And you don't need to be an assembly programmer to do that. You don't need to be somebody who studies hardware. You don't need to be a, a computer engineering major. You don't need to know any circuits. You just need to know the caches exist and how they work to write cache friendly code. So let me, let me give you a great example of this. So, the default way that you do a for loop is left to right, top to bottom, right? You, you go through a array like this, you know what I, you know what I mean? Like you, you read zero, zero, and then you read, uh, uh, what would be, uh, row zero, column one, row zero, column two, 
rows zero, column three, right? And once you get to the end, then you move down to row one, column zero. You guys all, you guys all with me on this? Like, this is just your normal for loop on a two D array. You just left, right, top to bottom. And this is how CPUs expect you to access memory. And because that's how they expect you to access memory, um, you're you're going to get more cache hits if you do it this way than if you were to go like this. Okay, if you were to go top to bottom left to right, you're going to get way more cache misses because cache lines grab um, 64 at a time. Yeah, okay. And a lot of times CPUs can have other optimizations on top of that where it's like, okay, he's doing a for loop and he's going to be grabbing a stream of data from this chunk of RAM. Let's just start streaming it in. Like there's a lot of really clever things that like Intel CPUs can do. Like they're like, okay, he's doing a for loop and he's starting here and he's, and he's going to here and and so he's going to be reading RAM like this. And so we're going to just set up a, a chunk of silicon to just sit there and fill cache ahead of the, the need. And so um, CPUs are very, very clever these days. And so they do all sorts of cool, cool things like that. But, but this only works up to a certain extent. If the array gets to be, if the array gets to be so big, then by the time you get to the end of the row, it's already evicted from cache. These guys had been read in before, right? Because you're reading the person above, the reading to the left, person to the right, person below. If these, if the array is so big that when you get to the right, these things have been evicted from cache already on the next row that should have been in there because you've read them, then you're going to get this massive slowdown that I was talking about. So let me, let me give you an example of how to make your code more cache friendly, which is exactly the right term that we use when talking about these things. Okay, so you got this 1 billion by 1 billion array, right? So what we'll do is we'll do this. First of all, we figure out what the cache size is. And you can actually do that by just accessing a 2D array, <laughs> right? You can actually just access a 2D array and you can plot the, you can plot the performance curve of it. And it'll look something like this. Uh, uh, and, and so you'll, you'll usually see these like inflection points uh, of like how fast, you know, things are taking place. And so then you're like, okay, that's the L1 size, that's the L2 size, that's the L3 size, that's RAM. You know, so you can actually just do some experiments over a 2D array of different sizes and figure out where, how big each of the caches are. You save that to a configuration file. And then, check this out, you access, let's say L1 cache is, uh, you know, 16K, just to pull out a number. What you do is rather than reading left to right, left to right, left to right over and over again, what you do is um, is this? You do a tile. Okay, so this is called tiling. Um, so what you do is you read and process a 16k chunk of the array in 2D, and so you go left to right, left to right, left to right, left to right, top to bottom, in a little 2D rectangle, a little 2D square, and then once you process that tile, you're going to get really good performance on it because again we're reading a left right up and down you you want the guy below you to still be in cache and so what you do is you process this tile and everything's in cache basically and then you move on to the next 16k tile you know like a 4k by 4k tile and so what you do is you chunk one big array into smaller arrays that fit within cache and you do all of your operations on them over and over again whatever it is you're doing and then you move on to the next tile and you do your operations over and over. And so you get all L1 cache hits, basically. You, you get a cold start miss the first time that you access the memory, but after that, everything's an L1 cache. And the, the amount of speed up you can get from, from that is nice. It's really nice. Is that an, a CPU optimization or is it in code? That is in, mm, that is not, uh, like I said, CPUs have gotten smart, but um, this would be in your C++ code. So you'd rather than writing a for loop for int i equals zero, i is less than one billion, you know, i plus plus, rather than doing that, uh, what you do is you go from int i equals zero to i is less than four four thousand, right? And then uh, and then the inner loop int j I can't even write. I'm not even gonna try. But you know what I mean. Um, so you do. Uh, you do a, 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 a for loop inside of the for loop. So you still you still read from left to right, top to bottom, 
but instead of just going in one row at a time, what you do is you put a, a doubly nested for loop inside of the doubly nested for loop. And so your, your axis pattern looks like this. You do, you do one square and then you move on to the next square and do all that. And you move on to the next square and do that. And so it's a, it's a 2D axis pattern inside of a 2D axis pattern. It's a quadruply nested for loop. Is the optimizer smart enough to fix if a screwed up for loop? No, probably not. Maybe. Probably not. Um, there, is, there is a tool called uh, Halide that will do this for you. So uh, with Halide, what you can do is you're like, uh, I, I'm going to be doing this, you know, averaging operation on this array, and Halide will do the tiling for you. So... There, and, and there's other tools as well that, that will do tiling. Uh, optimizers, uh, com compiler optimizers, uh, uh, the, the neighboring research lab when I was in college, they had written a tiling optimizer. And so the, um, the optimizer that they were working on, this was 20 years ago, uh, would detect when you had a large for loop and generate tiles for you automatically. So uh, is the optimizer smart enough to bring my wife and kids back? I'm afraid not. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, so there are, op there are optimizers that will do that. Um, whether or not it would fix, um, a broken for loop, I don't know. I, I, I kind of doubt it, but if you, uh, if you use either a tiling optimizer or a tool like Halide, then, um, it allows you to separate your, your, it'll, it allows you to separate what you want to do, which is to, you know, let's say average all the numbers in the array with the neighbors from the underlying architecture, right? The underlying architecture has an L1 cache size, an L2 cache size, an L3 cache size, a RAM size. And it's weird for you to bake that into your code. You know what I mean? Because your code should be able to run on any platform, right? And so Halide is the glue between the, the two that will allow you to write code saying I want to set each person to be the average of his neighbors and then it reconfigures the loop for the CPU that you're running on. So, yeah, that's that's a whole line of research. Like that was what um, uh, the uh, higher performance computing lab at UC San Diego was working on. Not my lab. We, we, did, we did something else that was kind of cool. Um... So does that make sense to you guys? Like, um, this isn't really a talk on high performance computing, but it kind of is because um, these cache effects are everywhere. They're everywhere. Um, you know, um, you know, we we mon you know when we do perf perfing, you know, I've I've said it before. I don't think I've spelled it. Um, there's like perf tools and things like that. One of the things that we we look at is the cache uh, hit rate. You know how how cache friendly are we? You know, and that's that's something we monitor because if you can get your cache hit rate up, then your code will run a lot faster, right? So rewriting your code to be more cache friendly is a very common optimization, and that's why you need to take this class. <laughs> so otherwise, you know. You know, if you're in JavaScript world, it's like you're so far removed from the hardware. It's like, how do you even, you know, you have no idea what's actually running <laughs> behind the scenes in JavaScript, right? Because you're like 10 different layers of abstraction. You're using some framework that's using another framework that is sitting on top of an interpreter that is sitting on top of the EMCA script jitter. You know, it's just like you're just throwing darts at the wall, you know, just hoping that it'll run fast. You know, whereas with C++, you're closer to the hardware. And so these kinds of decisions uh, more directly translate into results. Perfmon is the name of the program in Windows that shows the performance monitor. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, it's, uh, let's pull it up. Why not? Perfmon. Um, Uh, cache faults. 
network interface, physical disk, idle time, use the different drives that I have. Um, we'll talk about interrupts later. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, right there. And let's see if uh, add a counter. I need to do something. Uh, browse. read, hit percentage, copy read, I don't know if that's, that's exactly the right thing, uh, data map, hits, data flush, three pages, so we'll learn about virtual memory, um, yeah, anyhow, yeah, you can, you can run those tools and track track them over time and, and things like that. Fire up Cyberpunk 2077 and figure out why it's so slow. Right? <laughs> well, yeah, there's a new patch out. They just came out with patch 1.11 for Cyberpunk. That chart is a rocket ship to the moon. Yeah. Getting GameStop flashbacks on it. Um, what did evolves into Perfmon? <laughs> The perfect you, the perfect you. <laughs> uh, it's under process information at the top. Okay, yeah, yeah. So yeah, anyway, yeah. That's the kind of stuff we track, and um, there, there's different programs and perf tools and things like that that you can use to instrument your code. What's it, what's really interesting is that you can oftentimes write these things into a file, and then you can actually have the optimizer uh, read through the file, the the performance um, profile. You can profile your code, is what it's called. Um, so you can profile your code, which is that file there. And then when you compile your code again, you can feed it the profile. And then the optimizer knows now what your code is doing. And it can actually make more intelligent decisions about it. Um, and so that's really cool stuff. Um, what do we got? Eight minutes left in class. Uh, one other thing, I guess I will mention, which is vaguely on topic, which is called link time optimization. So you know how I talked about how inlining only works um, by copying and pasting source code. Um, if you're just compiling a, a .o file, like, you know, you got your, your foo.cc and you're going to turn that into foo.o object code, that, then foo.o will get merged with other .o files into an a.out. Um, once you've gone through this compilation process, normally, historically, this thing's kind of fixed in stone. But there's this thing called link time optimization that will actually um, do more performancey things at link time when you're going from the .o files, and you got bob.o, and you got a.o, and all these things are getting merged together. There's actually optimizers that are now running at link time, which is pretty exciting stuff because that allows you to have optimizations that span different translation units. So you can have optimizations that cut across different source code files, basically. And that's really exciting stuff. That's been happening within the oh, last few years, I guess. Um, yeah, LTO is pretty, pretty hot right now. Um, and so if, if you guys go and become a software engineer, which I assume probably two thirds of you will, what, what difference does any of this make? Well, first of all, everybody, everybody likes fast code, right? Like everybody wants their program to run quickly. You know, it's not just for video games, right? It, it, you know, I talk about frames per second, a lot of my video games classes, but it's not just video games. If you're, if you're, uh, if you're writing uh, financial uh, stock prediction stuff, um, you know, stock companies will purchase real estate as physically close to the New York Stock Exchange as possible because the speed of light is actually one of the limiting factors in them being able to place a trade before somebody else. 
So if they discover that there is a trade that will guaranteed make them money, they want to send that buy order in prior to somebody else noticing it and sending their buy order in. That's how, like, the the amount of time it... Like, they built a, a wireless network between uh, Chicago and New York so that the Chicago Commodities Exchange data could get to New York, this one trading company, faster than by internet, right? They built a cross-country internet line just so that they could have that millisecond advantage over another trader so that their high-speed trading software could be like, ah, frozen orange juice concentrates, that's the next, you know. And so um, that's the level of performance needed in the financial markets. And, uh, you know, B Bjarni Strustrup has been working for financial services companies for the last few years. I don't know if he's still there. But um, uh, the reason for that is because he wanted to get insight on their needs. Because uh, who uses C++? Video game companies, because we need speed. Uh, financial services company, because they need the speed. They need to buy something before somebody else discovers a good deal and buys it. Because sometimes you'll, you'll, find, um, you'll find opportunities that actually legitimately are guaranteed to make you money. And that sounds weird, but if your computer is fast enough, you can actually find these opportunities. Let's say that um, uh, that uh, America is uh, has a certain exchange rate with British pounds. British pounds have a certain exchange rate with uh, euros, and euros have a certain exchange rate with U.S. dollars. And ideally, if you sell dollars and buy pounds, and sell pounds and buy euros, and sell euros and buy dollars, you end up with the same amount of dollars you had before. But that's not always the case the exchange rates don't fluctuate perfectly. And so if there's a fluctuation that allows a cycle, graph theory, CSI 26, if you can find a cycle and there's a graph connecting every currency to every other currency, except maybe the Yuan, the, the RMB, the Chinese thing, because they don't, that, that's a whole different story. But there's a graph of like, you know, what if I sell US dollars, buy a bot from Thailand, and then use the bot to buy euros, and then use the euros to buy dollars. If you ever find any cycle on that graph that results in a positive exchange and you can place that trade before anyone else notices it, it is free money. <laughs> it is literally free money, right? Because what happens is like the money supply grows and shrinks in different places and the markets don't level out immediately. It's traders like that that level out the, the currency markets. And if they ever dis discover discrepancy, then they, it's free money. And what, what they're essentially doing is keeping the currency uh, markets balanced across all the different markets in the world. And so, um, and so why does caching matter? If you're going to be working for Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs or some of those companies, my Lord, you, you are going to need to understand what caching is. You're going to need to understand high performance computing. You're going to need to understand the optimizer. Uh, hell, you might you might actually need to write your, some of your code in assembly because every fraction of a second counts when you're working in that market, right? Because it, it, it's, it's, you're literally printing money if you can get an order in before other people. And, um, and people like free money, <laughs> you know? And if you're faster than everyone else, that's, you know, a, a million, a billion, a trillion, who knows? You know, it's just how, however much of that difference you can squeeze out before the markets even up again. It's called arbitrage, right? And um, and so there's arbitrage traders. And then and then you have your more common uh, stock market box. So most stocks are purchased by AI, right? So uh, AI buys and sells stocks. And um, uh, you want your AI to detect a good stock to buy before your competitors do. And there's a huge amount of volume of data available. And so your AI needs to process huge amounts of data and make a good decision. And if your AI is just 51% accurate, if your AI is just 51% accurate, you can print free money for the rest of your life, right? Because you take, you average that out over a huge number of gambles, right? It's the house edge. It's the reason why casinos are in business. If you, if you can bet a dollar and have a 50-50 chance of making 51 cents, you make that bet as many times as you can. And over time, it'll just average out and your money will just go up like that. And so that's why a lot of programmers make the big bucks doing AI and machine learning. Because if you 
All you need to be is 51% accurate. You don't have to be 99% accurate. No. 51% accurate. If you're just a little better than guessing, then it's you can print free money for the rest of your life. You know? And the yeah, and so the uh, the buy bots are buying all the GPUs, yeah, and Bitcoin mining and all that stuff. But that's that's a topic for another time. So go so much into debt and it's your overflows. That's funny. Yeah. So that's that's our lecture for today. So we learned two's complement today, and then we talked about the practical effects of caching, right? Um, and the different ways that caching actually really does make an impact in the real world. This is something you absolutely have to understand. You even if you're not writing assembly code, even if you're just a C plus plus programmer, understanding what caching is and just kind of having that mental model in your head, in the back of your head will allow you to write more cash friendly code and write code that will be more performant than people that um, have never taken this class. Okay, that's it for today, guys. Uh, we talked about shifting also. So left shift, right shift. Uh, we didn't talk about left shift. Left shift doesn't matter, <laughs> right? Left shifting doesn't matter. Left shift, it doesn't matter. The bits just go to the left and zeros fill in. But for right shift, you need to know if it's signed or unsigned. All right, that's the main thing about two's complement is shifting. Uh, is the worksheet pretty straightforward? The caching one, the one he's about to assign. Uh, you did the caching worksheet, right? That was due today. Okay. Um, but uh, I'm going to assign one on bit bit operations and things like that. So you guys get a little bit more uh, fluency with anding and oring and nodding and stuff like that. Two's complement. That was due two hours ago. Yeah. Good. Good. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll do two's complement and bit shifts and stuff like that. Yeah, it's it's... It's good to just develop a little bit of practice, a little bit of fluency with it. All right, that's it, guys. Um, got any questions, uh, let me know. I'll, I'll upload this video onto YouTube. And uh, uh, Asim, if is due on Tuesday. So get, get cracking on that if you have not already. All right, peace out.